to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, truth, or I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius, however, is spoken well of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon. We will talk face to face. Peace to you, the friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. I want you to imagine you go home from church today and in your inbox is an, aim, is an email that in the subject it says, urgent from Jesus. And you humor yourself and you open it up realizing it's spam, but then you realize it's not spam, it's a letter. How would your life change if you got a communication from God directly to you, telling you some encouraging things that you're doing and some things that you should change. Lean over to the person right now and look at them and tell them that what is the number one thing that they need to hear from Jesus? Turn around, lean over to the person next to you. What do they need to hear from Jesus right now? Now you can't see this uh, at home, but people are actually throwing fists right now. They're, uh, they're hitting each other. The thing that you need to hear right now is something really only you know. But I just want you to imagine if there was such a letter in the Bible, how incredible it would be to challenge us here in the 21st century, and that's exactly what we have in the letter of 3 John. We are in the middle of this series where we're, where we're looking at John's letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And John begins this letter, and it says, the elder. And that's because it's the Greek word presbyteros, which meant the office of an elder or a leader. We have a few of them here in our church. I am one. They are equal to me. I report to our elders. We call them our leadership team. Our pastors also function as elders, though they don't have the title of our leadership team members. And so John is, if you can bring this map up here, John in the first century went from Israel over here to the city of Ephesus. And here in Ephesus, for the last 25 years of the first century, he was the only apostle left. Out of 12, they went down when Judas committed suicide, they had 11, and John was the only one left, and for the next 25 years, he essentially is the leader of this whole area. There are churches everywhere, and that also means that there are problems 
everywhere, theological problems, uh, fighting, that sort of thing. And I don't know about you, did you watch the Olympics? One of my favorite things to watch during the entire Olympics, I didn't think I would like it, this guy, badminton. Badminton, this is Lin Dan from China. The guy is absolutely amazing. I'm watching badminton, and this guy is falling all over the place, diving. And immediately, when I was watching badminton, I was like, I'm going to announce my candidacy for the 2026 France Paris Olympics. Because I'm thinking, how hard, honestly, could a sport be if in the middle of it you could call time out and, and get two more bratwurst? Yeah, I want ketchup and a Diet Coke, right? How hard can that be? Well, this guy, look at this next picture. Man, he's diving everywhere, getting out. Uh, and this is exactly what the Apostle John is doing. Things are flying at him right and left. There are problems, there are theological problems. And John writes... First John and copies it and sends it to all of these churches, but we have an actual letter. It's the only one of John in the entire New Testament. This letter that was written to a friend of his, and his name was Gaius. It says, the elder, referring to John, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Now, I wanna show you this map here. I just spent two weeks in June in Turkey, and someone asked, how was your vacation? I was like, oh my gosh, I spent two weeks in a bus. We would go to this mountain, and they would say, and here are more rocks. Anyway, so, so it was good to see it, it was good to see it, but John is here in Ephesus, and what is happening, it started with the Apostle Paul, who was in Ephesus for a couple years, it continued with John. John from Ephesus would send out missionaries all throughout this area. And I don't know um, if you've ever been to central Turkey. Um, central Turkey is what we would call a uh, redneck area. These are the people that were uh, uh, people on the movie Deliverance. And, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, the old joke. Uh, Pittsburgh on one side, Philadelphia on the other, and Alabama in the middle. That's what Pennsylvania is. And so that's exactly what it's like. When you get away from the coast, this area in Phrygia is so so like staunch that when Alexander the Great came over here from Macedonia and conquered this area first, he left a whole battalion here. These people were such troublemakers and so obstinate that when he went on and eventually died in India, uh, he left an army here. Now, so the reason I bring this up is that John is sending out missionaries all throughout this area. This letter that we're reading, which is 3 John, is an actual letter that was written for a church planter. Let's look at it in verse 12. His name is Demetrius. If you're pregnant, you're looking for a guy's name, great name, Demetrius. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, even by the truth itself, and we also speak of him. And so if you show this picture right here of this papyrus, this is the actual papyrus of 3 John. And so, um, what John does is he writes this letter, gives it to Demetrius, and can you bring the map back up here? He says, when, you fold it up, put it in your back pocket, when you get out here in the middle, somewhere, you're gonna start a church out here at one of these towns, we don't know which one it is. There is a friend of mine, his name is Gaius. I want you to look him up, and he is gonna provide for you. And what, what did Gaius do for Demetrius? Verse two, it says this, dear friend, I pray that, you're enjoy, that you may enjoy good health, that may all, all go along with you. It gives me great joy, right, to hear that my children, referring to Gaius, is walking in the truth. What was Gaius doing that John commended him for? It's this, verse five. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters even though they're strangers to you. John gave a letter to Demetrius who sent him to Gaius in the middle of the country because he knew Gaius once. It's like terrible. It's like a terrible drive, just getting there, going through the mountains and the roads and the bump and all of that. He gets to Gaius and what did Gaius do? Gaius welcomed Demetrius in his home. Never met him before. I want you to imagine that this week, a stranger shows up to your house and says, 
hi, Pastor Brian sent me here and said I could live with you for a couple weeks. Pulls out a letter from me called Third Brian and gives it to you and you read it. Lean over to the person next to you and be honest. Would you let that person live with you? Just based on my word alone, would you let him live with you for two weeks? Yes or no? You at home here? Raise your hand if you would. Okay? I see some hands. Raise your hand if you're going to hell. <laughs> right? No, most of us would be like, no way, bro. I'm not going to do that. There's no way I'm going to do that. Well, this verse continues. He said, listen, dear friend, you're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters. Even though they're strangers to you, they have told. So people have come back from Gaius, the church planters that have gone out, lived with Gaius for a couple weeks, gone and planted a church, come back to Ephesus where John is. These people are saying, you are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters, these missionaries, even though they're strangers for you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God and, was, and it's for the sake of the name, Jesus, that they went out from Ephesus and are receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality, and we're gonna come back to that word, to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Now, the reason Gaius was so willing to do this is because the apostle John remembered what Jesus told him, and John told Gaius what Jesus said, which was, in John 13, 20, very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. So if you can, can you bring the map up again? Well, so John's in Ephesus, sends Demetrius out to the middle of this area. It's rough. John has a person he had discipled named Gaius. Demetrius stays with Gaius for a couple weeks, goes on and plants a church with a bunch of rednecks who probably wanted to kill him because most of them died. News got back. He was incredibly thankful. Gaius gave Demetrius money, a house, maybe a donkey, food and money to last him for maybe two or three months. And he did this because Jesus told the disciples to go. And in this area, last time we checked, there are no Holiday Inn Expresses. Now what does that have to mean with us? Everything, because in this area, there was another guy. His name was Diotrephes. And he was like, I am not gonna do what the Apostle John is asking because honestly, I'm not letting a stranger in my house, whether it's Brian Jones asking or whether it's Apostle of Jesus asking. Look at what it says in verse nine. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first. In the original Greek, it's one word. It's the word, Greek word, first lover. Do you know anybody in your life that is a first lover? Their opinion is first and best. They wanna be first in making the decisions. They're right, they wanna control you, they wanna lead. They're a first lover. That's what Diotrephes, and the way it came out in the church was, it says, who loves me first will not welcome us. Who is us? These are the missionaries that are coming from John, from Ephesus to plant churches all in through that area. And they know in that area there is a church, but in that church is a guy named Diot, Diot, or Diot. I'm trying, I'm losing count here. Diotrephes, and Diotrephes is saying, I don't give a jack crap what the apostles saying. Those people are not staying in my house. Not only are they not staying in the house, I'm not gonna allow them to come to the church. So when I come, John says, and I'm gonna come out there in the middle of nowhere, and when I come, I'm gonna call attention to what he's doing. He's spreading malicious nonsense about us, and not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do 
um, who wants to do so and puts them out of church. Friday, Lisa and I went to uh, see Respect, a movie about Aretha Franklin, movie of the year, hands down, actress of the year, hands down. Absolutely amazing. Uh, we went to Respect, and because I'm Big Daddy Warbucks, we didn't get dessert there, we picked it up a giant. Because just telling you right now, if you're going out on a date with me, we're going Dutch, okay? That's just the way it is. So, so we go to the movie, and on the way um, to Giant to pick up some ice cream, for the very first time in our general area, which is a fairly affluent area, I saw a guy holding a sign. Guy with the sign says, lost home, living in a tent. I've told you before that in the teachings of Jesus and Matthew, Matthew chapter six to be precise, he says that his disciples ought to be prepared to give alms. So I take that literally, Jesus meant that. So every time I get paid, when I go to the grocery, then I'll get cash back, I'll get it in tens, I'll take those, I'll fold them, put them in the corner of my wallet, and when I see someone that's in need, I'll give them that money. I see this guy with a sign, and I generally don't like to give alms to someone that's asking for money. I like to give it to someone that's in need. So I drive by this guy. But he sticks in my head. You ever had that happen? Sticks in my head. I get into giant, and then I begin thinking about my toilets. We moved in our house probably about three and a half years ago. And we fixed up the kitchen and painted and, and, and that sort of thing. But we didn't do the toilets because I thought these toilets are just fine. I got a toilet upstairs, toilet downstairs. Well, turns out the toilets are not just fine. That every time you use the bathroom, if you go number two, for those who don't know what that is, that's poop. <laughs> every time you poop, You flush, starts filling up. Your instant reaction when it's filling up? Lord Jesus, you healed people in the first century. <laughs> Remove this demon from this toilet, Lord Jesus, right? Never works, so I'm plunging every time I'm going number two. It's like Russian roulette, man. This thing, oh, there it goes again, right? So. So about a week and a half ago, got up from the toilet, it's coming up, to, I was like, that's it, that is it, you're gone. So I went and researched online, best flushing toilet. Found a toilet that claims to be able to flush 25 golf balls in one flush. I'm like, that, that's what I want. So I went to Lowe's, got the toilet, brought them back, there's a little problem. They're so powerful that when you flush it, it shoots water up in the air like a bidet. So if you come and visit, you're getting clean. That's just the way it is. So anyway, I'm in Giant, I'm thinking about this guy and I'm thinking about my toilets. And I'm like, I've got a toilet. I got a toilet upstairs and I got a toilet downstairs. And this guy's living in a tent. He doesn't have a toilet, but how do I know he actually needs the money? And if I give him the money, I might be taking it from someone else that really needs the money. I'm going back and forth in Giant, thinking about the guy, I'm thinking about toilets, I'm thinking about poop, I'm getting dessert. <laughs> I check out with our dessert. Dessert came, I don't know, the 20 some dollars. Milk, little chocolate cakes, you get the chocolate cakes? You have not lived. Chocolate cakes, vanilla ice cream, and you get, about $20, and I get out to the car. I'm like, I have two toilets, two. I have two toilets. This guy's living in a tent. So I drove by, took the money out, I handed it to him and drove away. I, among everyone,
everyone sort of looks at the teachings of Jesus and like, ah, oh, he didn't really mean that. You know, I don't really need to do that and that sort of thing. And I just want to be the disciple of Jesus that starts living as if Jesus actually meant what he said. And the problem is, it's not that you and I are inherently like Diotrephes. It's that you and I are inherently like Gaius, sometimes when we're generous, and we're like Diotrephes. Right? There are times where we're like, oh my gosh, yeah, it was generous, it was amazing, that sort of thing. And then other times we're like, no, you, dude, you're not sleeping in my house. No way in the world I'm letting you sleep. I, w I wouldn't let you use my toilet, let alone sleep in my house. And so it says, John says to Gaius, dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. What do you mean what is evil? Anyone who does what is good is from God, and anyone who does what is evil has not been sent from God. And what is John saying? John is referring to, look at the verse before, in verse 10, Diotrephes won't help people, is kicking them out of the church, he won't give them of his resources, and what essentially what Jesus is saying through John is that when those of us are disciples of Jesus and we have resources and we do choose not to be generous, we're doing what is evil. We have not seen God. And you think about that, that's some harsh language. That's some harsh language to call us out, particularly because John was the first lover in the Gospels. Remember uh, Mark chapter 10, James and John at night come up to Jesus and they're like, bro, listen, great idea. When this all, th when this all goes down here in a few weeks, we wanna sit at your right and your left, James and John. And Jesus is like, no, nah, that's not gonna happen. 60 some years later, John is in a situation where he sees this guy named Diotrephes and he's like, listen, I've been in that situation before. We all have within us this desire to be a first lover in what's going on. Don't do that. And then he says, Demetrius, this church planner spoken well of, John says, I have much to write you, but I don't want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon. We will talk face to face, and I love this ending. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Disciples of Jesus. The friends send their greetings and greet the friends there by name. I wanna ask you two questions based on this letter. Now I want you to assume that this is a letter that was written just for you. First question is this. How generous are you being with your money right now? Are you tithing? Have you given anything in the last month? And just so you know, I don't check your giving. It's not like I'm seeing them down the hold on, I got some work to do. Hold on. I don't know. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know. Between you and God. But God knows and you know. And I hadn't planned to talk about money, but this, this is a letter about generosity and hospitality, so we need to ask ourselves. In the last two months, have you given to the poor and to the spread of the gospel by giving to CCV? Have you given more than what your cell phone bill is? Do you love God more than your cell phone bill? Do you love God more than your cable bill? Do you love God more than your car payment? Do you love God more than your mortgage payment? Where in the list of priorities in the last couple months we have to ask ourselves, and I'm gonna include all of us, we have to ask, in the list of priorities of the things that we're going to spend money on to bring comfort and security to our lives, where in that list does God fall? And so what, this is a challenge to us. So I wanna encourage you to go back and to review that. This church has been so incredibly generous through the years, and you talk to anybody here that has experienced the joy of giving, they will tell you that you get back more than you ever give. Our finance team has said things are tight right now. 
And so I just thought I'd share that with you. We're at the end of the summer. People are going on vacation. When that happens, giving drops. So things are tight. So based on what we're learning here, just go back and evaluate where you're giving us. Maybe you can make up for the summer. Maybe you can make a one-time gift. That's between you and God. But I want us to start asking as, I want us to start living as if, like Jesus actually meant this stuff. And what would happen if we started doing it? Here's the second question. How generous are you being with your home and your possessions? When was the last time you had someone over for a small group, for a discussion? Someone that was poor? Yeah, like, we have a few thousand people that, that are a part of CCV, right? Should there ever be in any situation someone that is homeless in this immediate area? The solution to homelessness is not get your act together. You have been lazy. What the heck is going on? I'm not going to supplement your laziness. It's just the solution to homelessness is being a friend. When I was a kid, we always had missionaries at our house. I thought it was strange. I thought all Christians had missionaries over their house. Later learned that's not the case. My favorite missionary was Kathy Taylor. A lot of people will ask, why do we have women preach? Why do we have women in leadership? And it's because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. That's the example and what, what scripture teaches. Um, and then people, some people occasionally will try to argue with me and I don't argue. We just create opportunities for women to serve equally with men and that silences them right away. Anyway, one of our favorite men, missionaries that would, came, that would come to our house, her name was Kathy Taylor. She was a pastor of a church that she started in Brooklyn. And uh, this was back in Brooklyn when Brooklyn wasn't nice. Some of you came from Brooklyn like a couple years ago. You like lived in Park Slope. Bro, that's not Brooklyn. She was a church planner in Brooklyn walking the streets before it became this gentrified place. I remember when Kathy would come over, there was my room and then my parents would let Kathy stay in my sister's room. And I always knew Kathy was getting ready in the morning because she would get up early, take a shower, brush her teeth so she could read the Bible. And through the wall, I would hear her like, what is that? I'm like, do women actually do that? Do women like hawk loogies in the sink when they're brushing their teeth? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna, come on, I'm gonna throw up right now. Please stop, dear God, stop her, strike her dead. And then she would put this uh, perfume on that would just all encompassing. You know, when you, when you meet a woman and it's like, honestly, I don't care what you think anymore. I'm going with seven doses of this baby and you're gonna smell me 18 feet away. That was Kathy. And other than those two things, she was one of the greatest women in my life. Other than my mother and other than my wife and my two sisters. Honestly, if we were to make a list from birth till I graduated high school of the most amazing things that happened in our lives, she would be near the top. And that's kind of the misconstrual we have about hospitality and generosity is that we think that, oh, God's making me do this and guilting me in to do this. No, we get to do this. We don't have to do this. We get to do this. So I want to ask you, I want you to go home this week and I want you to look at your clothing and I want you to look at your shoes. And I want you to ask, who could I give these two to bless? I want you to look at your car. A few years ago, I said, Lisa knows this mom who doesn't have a car and she can't get her son to all these different places. She's concerned about her son. He might get into some things and she wasn't, wants to keep him involved in different activities. You don't want to know what happened after the service? Three people offered to give me a car. Three. I said, is one a Tesla? Because I could use a Tesla. Right? 
I would preach so much better driving a Tesla. I want you to think of your computer equipment. Whatever resources you have, what would happen if you went like this? And you said, God, yes, you're giving these things to me for your enjoyment, but you're also giving these things to me to be a steward of. So if you need my house, if you need my car, if you need the extra equipment, the clothes, the shoes, they're yours. Help, help me to work together to preach the gospel, both by what I do and what I say, through what you've given me. Let's pray. We're so incredibly thankful, God, that in a, in a, in a culture that is just so harsh, in a world that is so broken, we think right now of Haiti, we think right now of Afghanistan, we think of the security that we have, the fact that we could take a shower this morning, the fact that most people in this room are not worried about whether or not they're gonna have lunch in the next hour, whether or not they're gonna be able to get to their job or not. You have blessed us with resources. Let us in turn be a blessing to others. Let us in action actually realize that yeah, you're right, it is. It is so much better to give than it is to receive. In our working together and our partnership for the gospel, God, we pray that as we bring heaven to earth and earth to heaven, that you would help us to bring other people into this great story of Jesus, this great story of hope and redemption and salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.